Hey, welcome back to Business 150, Introduction to Management. And this is now video number two in our look at content from chapter two about history and theory of managerial thought. And you can see here from the title slide, in this lecture, we're looking at the classical approach to management. Some of you may be familiar with classical music. I grew up learning classical piano, Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, those kinds of things. I mention that simply because it has absolutely nothing to do with this lecture. Just saw the word classical and it brought it to mind. But we are looking at the classical approach to management in this lecture. And so after the conclusion of this short video, you should be able to explain the major theories within the classical approach to management and describe some of the advantages and disadvantages of those approaches to management today. So just as a reminder, there are four major approaches to management that come out of historical thought. The first is the classical, that's the topic of this lecture. Next lecture, we'll talk about the behavioral approach. And then the, the lecture after that, we'll look at both the systems and the contingency approach together in that next video. So today we're just looking at the classical approach to management. And the first thing I wanna tell you is that the classical management perspective comes in two branches or two flavors. If I could call it chocolate and vanilla, it would be more memorable to you. Unfortunately, the textbook uses sort of boring old names like scientific and administrative management. And that, quite frankly, those kinds of names make it difficult for, you, uh, for students to remember which one is which. It really does. It was difficult for me the first time I encountered it. I'd get them confused, right, on an exam or a quiz or something. And so, I don't know, can you call it chocolate and vanilla or maybe hamster and gerbil? I mean, if we had more colorful names, they're a little bit easier. But for today, let's stick with the textbook. Scientific management, which generally speaking, focuses upon increasing the performance of individual workers, that's what scientific management's all about, versus the school of administrative management, which as you can see there, generally increased on, uh, I'm sorry, generally focused on increasing performance of the entire organization not just the individual worker. And so, as you can see there, these two branches or flavors of the classical management approach focused on different things. One focused on individual workers and their work, and the other focused on the entire organization as a whole. Now, when we talk about scientific management, probably the quote unquote father of scientific management is generally considered to be a gentleman by the name of Frederick Taylor. You see the years in which he lived, right? And Frederick Taylor standardized things like training and the role and supervision and how you pay for performance. And so he did a lot of landmark work that helped us really develop a science behind managing women and men. And so uh, the problem that Frederick Taylor encountered during his work was this whole idea or this, this phenomena that he called soldiering. You can see what soldiering is. Soldiering is the phenomena where you see a bunch of folks who work at a particular job and they are intentionally working below their actual potential. They're underperforming and deliberately and intentionally so. Why are they doing that? Because they are hoping that their boss will never really know how fast this job could actually be performed and therefore they can be lazy and lollygag and take their time and keep their boss in the dark. Now, before we go any further on this slide, some of you listening to this lecture are currently working or have been recently working and you know exactly what I'm talking about because you used to have that dude or that dudette on your job that was never really putting in a full day's worth of work, right? You know that person I'm talking about, the person that you really had a hard time with because they would always show up late and leave early and they would only really do hard work when they thought the boss was watching them. As soon as the boss was gone or not watching them, they'd be off back on their phone, social media, Facebook, Snapchat, selfie, TikTok, whatever it was they were doing, right? And they only got back to work when they thought that the boss was watching. That is exactly what we're talking about here. 
soldiering, intentionally working below their potential, underperforming in production. And so what Frederick Taylor did to try to address this issue that you saw all the way back in his day, right? Back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, was he said, okay, wait a minute, let's try to apply some scientific principles. Let's study the work itself. And rather than have every man on the job perform the job how they think it should be done, let's standardize exactly what the steps are to perform this particular job. And therefore, if we study it and we decide there are 13 steps to doing this job, then we make sure we train people to do those 13 steps and that we're not gonna have them do 14 or 18 or 17 or 12. They gotta follow the 13. And so you can see there, number one, develop a science for each element of the job to replace the old rule of thumb method methods. Number two, scientifically select employees and then train them to do the job as described in step one. Number three, supervise employees to make sure they are following the prescribed methods for performing their jobs. Hey Jim, why are you taking 17 steps to do this? We already trained you, it's 13 steps. Get back on the program. Do it the 13 steps. You'll get more production done. And number four, continue to plan the work, but use workers to get the work done. And so you can see here that he brought in things like applying standardized training, instruction cards, incentive piecework pay systems. And we look at this today and we may say, well, of course, work has always been this way. And I will tell you, it hasn't. That's the whole point of scientific management, Frederick Taylor. This was the first attempt to introduce these concepts, much of which we now take for granted as just a normal part of how work is done. It wasn't always that way, and that's why Frederick Taylor is known as the ad hoc father of scientific management. Moving along, remember that there are two branches of the classical approach, the second branch being the administrative management branch, and you see here the names of and the accomplishments of some of these people early on who thought about administrative management and then ended up introducing things like the four managerial functions that we still talk about to this day, or the integration of scientific and administrative principles, or studying efficient organizational structures, or writing about this theory of the acceptance of authority, how it is that employees get to the point they're willing to take the word of their boss to instruct them. All these kinds of contributions formed this other school of the classical approach to management, which was the administrative management branch, primarily focusing upon the entire organization. And of course, so what? So what does this mean to us today? Why should we even think about this stuff? Well, you can see here in this chart, the general summary of classical management. Classical management had these two primary thrusts, the scientific management branch that focused on employees and the administrative management branch which focused on the organization as a whole. Now, why are we standing on the shoulders of classical management today? Because classical management emphasized getting work done efficiently, getting the most out of our time and resources. It laid the foundation for later developments in management theory. It was the reason why we started looking at management as a valid subject for academic and scientific thought and inquiry. And it identified some very important management processes and functions and skills that we still recognize today. But it's not all that. It's not without its weaknesses. You can see there the last row, limitations of classical management. Classical management is really the most appropriate for very simple, stable organizations that are in business today. And most organizations, quite frankly, nowadays are not stable and simple. Most organizations are changing on a weekly basis in complex environments. You know what I'm talking about. And so there's really only very few types of organizations today that still exist where classical management is the first go-to. Often classical management would suggest universal procedures that simply aren't appropriate in some settings and would typically focus too narrowly on just getting the work done, getting the work done, getting the work done therefore ignoring the fact that it's people who are getting the work done. In other words, classical management is 
sort of notorious for ignoring the human being in the aspect of work, simply seeing employees as a gear, a, a cog in the work, a tool in the machine, rather than a valuable source of innovation and creativity and effort and performance. So classical management has been helpful for us. It isn't exactly the only principle or even the most contemporary principles that we'll look at, but it did provide a foundation for us to build upon. And therefore, you should be able to explain the major theories within the classical approach to management and describe some of the advantages and disadvantages that classical approach gives to us today. Well, I hope that that has been helpful for you. It is the very first of the four major approaches that we look at. It's contributed a lot, and it's not really the most contemporary approach we use today to manage. That's the classical approach to management. Hope it's helpful. We'll see you in the next video.